As the fighting rages in Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, the International Criminal Court has issued a warrant for Putin's arrest, accusing him of the war crime of unlawfully transferring at least hundreds of children from occupied areas of Ukraine to Russia. My guest this week on Conflict Zone has called the deportation of children a genocide and demands justice. Ukrainian MP and chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Integration of Ukraine to the EU, Ivana Klimpush Tsintsadze, joins me from Kyiv. She also served as deputy prime minister under President Poroshenko. This warrant is, I'm sure, not the last warrant that ICC will issue um, against President Putin for his war crimes and, and crimes against humanity. Can Ukraine get its children back? Can justice be served? And as it fights for its survival, how prepared is it for a spring offensive? Ivana Klimpur Sinsadze, welcome to Conflict Zone. Thank you for having me. The International Criminal Court has accused Russian President Vladimir Putin of the war crime of unlawfully deporting at least hundreds of children from Ukraine. Do you think he will be brought to justice? Well, definitely, I see this as a first step um, with hope that this war will be finished with justice. And uh, this warrant is, I'm sure, not the last warrant that ICC will issue um, against President Putin for his war crimes and, and crimes against humanity that are being conducted under his command on the Ukrainian land. Moscow, meantime, has signaled that more transfers of children are on the way. Many of these children are especially vulnerable, and we're talking about infants, sick children, orphans. They may be lost forever if there is no trace of them. What can you actually do? Well, that's a very, very painful question. Uh, we have right now about 14,000 uh, recorded cases of the uh, forceful uh, the deportation of Ukrainian children. But we understand that, unfortunately, there are many more uh, of them being taken from their parents or those who have become orphans uh, that we have no access to for that uh, specific data at this particular moment. And only 300 have been brought home uh, up till now. So we need all the efforts of all the international organizations, non-governmental actors, uh, everybody who could help bring Ukrainian uh, children back home. Because this is not just the war crime. This is also a, one of the traces of genocide. And this is exactly the act, act of genocide of the Ukrainian nation, this deportation and, and stealing of the Ukrainian uh, children from uh, Ukrainian families. So you've called it a genocide right there. Uh, to be clear, prosecutors to date have, have not brought genocide charges. Um, but the UN Commission for Inquiry um, on Ukraine just last week said that it was indeed a war crime. And they also said that war crimes additionally include attacks on civilians, energy-related infrastructure, willful killings, unlawful confinement, torture, rape, other sexual violence. President Zelensky's office has said that the arrest warrant for Putin is just the beginning. What do you want to see? What more? Well, definitely, we want to ensure that Mr. Putin and all his clique and all his uh, comrades are brought to justice, and also all those who have been carrying out those um, war crimes on the territory of Ukraine. But we also would like to see the um, creation of the international tribunal that would lead to um, bringing Mr. Putin for justice under the uh, crime of the aggression that cannot be unfortunately tried un under the ICC. And yes, you are talking about war crimes, but the problem is that at this particular uh, point, we are all operating, both the international community, Ukrainian uh, authorities, we are all operating with the confirmed legal data. The problem is that the occupied territories, on the occupied territories, Russian Federation continue this brutal crimes. And unfortunately, the whole humanity does not yet have access to understanding what type of um, crimes have been happening there, as we saw in liberated areas like in Bucha or in Izum in Kharkiv region or in Kherson. So unfortunately, I believe we are still uh, to see the, the, the brutality of this war. And I hope that the brutality of this war will be then um, 
finished with the with the justice and those who are guilty of that brutality being brought um, under the investigation and basically put behind the bars. The likelihood of a trial while Putin remains in power, though, appears slim. What real world consequences can, can you realistically hope for right now? Well, at this point, uh, I think more of isolation for Mr. Putin definitely should be the case. We also hope that all the uh, countries' parties to the Rome Statute would also take um, that seriously, the ICC arrest warrant, as we already heard from the uh, German government, from the uh, German Ministry of Justice, uh, so that he will be limited also in his international travel. Uh, we also believe that this arrest warrant will um, make think twice all those who are continuously carrying out and supporting uh, the decisions that uh, Putin is taking in this war. So um, they might think, um, you know, rethink their uh, approach and their actions in order to preserve themselves and their families in the future. So I think it will have also, and it also has, I think, a very serious um, ray of hope for all those Ukrainian families that have lost the last ones, their uh, their homes, um, their health in this in this um, barbaric war that Russia is um, conducting against and carrying out against Ukraine and the free world. So I hope that they are uh, that this hope is also um, creates additional um, possibility to find uh, some kind of, of uh, closure uh, for those families as well. Many of the children um, who have been deported to Russia came from the Mariupol area, uh, which was taken by Russia about 10 months ago. Uh, the Kremlin has reported that Putin made a surprise visit to Mariupol and Crimea in the wake of the ICC warrant. How provocative do you see that move? I think it's a you know pitiful attempt to, um, to tell something uh, that they are um, quote and unquote, have everything under control. And that is mostly, I think, the message for their domestic audience uh, to say that um, they are taking care of the of the occupied territories, which has nothing to do with the reality. They first um, turned down the city uh, to ashes and uh, now are building Potomkin villages to show off um, to the uh, to the society in the Russian Federation. But I think it looks... Um, it looks rather, uh, you know, kind of uh, pitiful, as I said. It's the first time, though, that, that Putin has visited the Donbass region since announcing last September that he was annexing it. What do you make of the timing? Well, as I said, you know, he's trying to, to show in the... Um, when we see the arrest warrant from the ICC on one side, when he is more and more isolated internationally, when the um, the economy of the Russian Federation is becoming weaker, when the pressure on the society is also becoming uh, stronger uh, in the Russian Federation, he is trying to sell this as if there are any victories um, for the Russian Federation that they are uh, making up in his mind. And we we have seen such theatrical scenes before um, in in different versions uh, from Putin. So that is just another uh, attempt from his propaganda to show him as a strong leader. Let's talk about your international partners. In the U.S., the Pentagon is blocking the Biden administration from sharing evidence with the ICC gathered by American intelligence agencies about Russian atrocities in Ukraine. Do you find that acceptable, given how high the stakes are for these children, these vulnerable children? I'm sure that there will be a legal uh, solution found to have access to as much information as there is available in the world. Uh, Do you have any indication of that partners. happening from the Americans? I am not part of this negotiation, so I cannot comment on that. But do you find it acceptable that that's what they've been doing, that this is the decision that the Pentagon has made, that this is what it's advising the Biden administration? I think that they will find the the possibility to uh, provide as much as uh, information as it is as it is needed to ensure that um, uh, criminals are brought to justice.
Let's talk about the situation on the battlefield. President Zelensky has said that Ukraine's future depends on the outcome of battles in key points in the east of the country, including in Bakhmut. And now we've just had word that authorities in Avdivka are urging residents to evacuate amid fears that Russian forces are attempting to encircle it. The fear there is that the situation might become the same as or similar to that in Bakhmut. How critical is this moment right now? Well, we see the um, continuous effort of the Russian Federation to exhaust Ukrainian armed forces, to exhaust uh, Ukraine as a country and as a society, as, and exhaust also the willingness of the West to support Ukraine. And that's why I think the, the critical situation right now is in ensuring that um, efficient and very urgent and fast delivery of the weaponry that has been pledged already for Ukraine is taking place. So I think that this is critical from that perspective so that Ukrainians um, on the top of their bravery, of the, on the top of their courage, would have actual instruments enough at hand to be able to A, protect our land and B, to liberate our lands. Zelensky has vowed to destroy Russia's military power there. Um, you mentioned your partners. You can't do that without support from your Western partners, how can that be achieved? Well, yes, we cannot achieve this without uh, without support of our Western partners, and uh, that can be achieved only with deep understanding of every single partner, um, both on the political elite level and on the societal level, of the threat and the uh, risks of the Russian behavior that it carries out for them as well. It's not exclusively about Ukraine. It's about changing the international order. It's about uh, attempting to reinstall uh, or to to, uh, to install actually totally different culture in the international law and uh, trying to suggest that by force the borders of the countries can be changed and their is impunity to the to the crimes that are carried out under the uh, pretext that is made up. So, therefore, I think understanding is the key uh, to uh, both long-standing support, but also to the urgent and very prompt support that we need right now. Is the battle for Bakhmut a must-win? Should it be at any cost? I think the must. I think the must win is the battle for um, democracy, freedom and international law. And that is the battle for Ukraine. And if that is requiring, you know, specific uh, tactical military, uh, even withdrawals on our side, I think that that is should be the case. I think it's not about, uh, you know, holding part of the territory of uh, at any cost is it's, it's about planning how to ensure that all the territory is regained. Poland and Slovakia have said that they will send MiG-29 fighter jets to Ukraine in the coming days. You criticized partners uh, for being too slow last year. Has that changed? Are you happy with the levels of support right now? Uh, as I said, we are grateful for everything that has been already delivered to Ukraine, both for financial, political, and military aid that has been provided to the country. Um, unfortunately, some of the decisions, as we have seen with the whole long discussion on tanks, have uh, postponed these deliveries and have postponed the possibility of training of our, of our defenders um, in different uh, countries um, as the decisions were not taken. So I'd really love um, you know, Western political uh, elite be as courageous as uh, Ukrainian armed forces and Ukrainian society has been up till now in order to ensure that they are not taking uh, late decisions that, that might cost us additional um, loss of life. But there are practical realities, and let's go through some of them. Um, EU ministers have approved uh, a 2 billion euro plan to supply Ukraine with badly needed ammunition. Um, but, you know, your country is saying that it needs 350,000 shells every month to stave off Russia's offensive in the east and to prepare for a spring offensive. Stocks are already running low among your partners. Um, are you confident that your allies can supply the ammunition at the rate that you need it? Uh, I think the right answer would be that we hope that they will. And um, yes, um, this decision that we value uh, by the EU ministers um, that was taken a couple of days ago, we value it very, very highly. But uh, it's again, one of those decisions that 
would have been uh, we would have been much better off if if it was taken a couple of months before. So therefore, right now, it's about the speed of the implementation of these decisions and also about the speed of uh, similar approaches of um, additional production in different other countries that are also partners in this uh, and supporters of Ukraine in this war. Uh, I think that uh, we can also count on the US, we can also count on Canada. We are seeing the also attempts already in, in uh, Japan to change their legislation to, to help us. So we are counting on other partners beyond Europe as well. And uh, all that together, I hope, will make it happen. But you're seeing the situation around the world. You're seeing countries facing energy crisis, uh, citizens facing soaring costs of living. And I'm wondering if you personally are concerned that support could wane. We understand that that is the expectation of the Russian Federation. And here I'm coming back to what I said earlier. It is important to understand that this is not a um, only existential threat to Ukraine. It is existential threat to the way of living of many, many countries uh, and many, many societies. Even what we see with the food um, security issue, how Russia has been using this leverage and, and how many countries have understood that Ukraine has been that this breadbasket for for. Uh, lots of nations around the world and Russia is playing with that leverage as well. So understanding and getting on board in the war where it's black and white, where is the war for, of good against evil, um, countries getting on board, this is important. Whether they will be uh, getting tired, I'm sure that Russian propaganda and Russian money and Russian corruption money will be trying to work to that end. Uh, but I hope that the tectonic changes in understanding what Ukrainians stand for and what are the consequences of Russia not being defeated for the whole world and for the whole global security are uh, getting root across the, uh, the whole um, different continents. Against that backdrop, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping has been uh, visiting Russian President Vladimir Putin on a, on a state visit in Moscow. That trip has been framed um, as a mission of peace with China calling for talks. Would you support that? Well, we've seen the plan that, uh, or so-called plan that uh, China has uh, put forward. Uh, we did not uh, see the actual preconditions for actual um, for actual peace um, being reached through that particular plan because it doesn't say anything about the withdrawal of Russian troops from this from the sovereign territory of the uh, sovereign independent country uh, with recognized borders under the international law. So I'm a bit skeptical with regard to to that suggestion to put it very diplomatically and very mildly. You mentioned um, your aim from the Ukrainian side, which is the withdrawal of, of Russian troops. And I'd just like to bring in something that the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff has, has said about that, Mark Milley. He said that he believes that this war will end at the negotiating table with neither side likely to achieve their military aims. They got, again, neither side likely. Do you think that at some point Ukraine will have to accept that as a reality sooner or later? I think it also depends uh, very much on uh, whether our partners have made up their mind that Russia actually has to be defeated in this war. Because we've seen the, the development of the narrative from Russia cannot win in this war uh, to Ukraine has to win in this war to Russia has to be defeated, but not uh, necessarily um, destroyed, so to say. And I think we are not still there with full understanding of uh, what the goals of the of the whole world are and the the fear that is still there at some uh, in some political levels from the Russian Federation being a nuclear uh, power i think is uh, also limiting the possibilities for the armed forces of ukraine to to liberate our own territories so um, i do know that every single war is finished with negotiations, but I think that it is in the interest of the whole uh, continent and world that it is finished with negotiations after Ukraine has um, liberated all its territories. Behind closed doors, though, uh, right now in the parliament, is there a conversation happening uh, about how the government might approach peace talks? 
No, there is no such conversation at this point. Uh, you have to understand that we have already once surrendered and negotiated a century ago with the Russian, uh, then Russian Empire or then Russian Federation as a Soviet Republic. And we have, um, as a result of that occupation, we have seen the great famine on the territory of Ukraine, the great Holodomor. We have seen the the atrocities when Gulag uh, was exterminating uh, our best of the best. We have seen the the um, uh, the tragedies of many many families in our world. So. We understand that now we cannot allow that to happen once again. Many countries around the world, um, especially in the global south, they continue to trade with Russia. Um, they have not condemned the invasion. The world is split in many ways. Not everyone has sympathy for you. Do you feel that split and how dangerous do you think it might be? Yes, we do feel the split. We are not naive. And um, that is unfortunately also the result of our under-representation and our um, not enough work in those parts of the world and Russia's serious um, financial and informational presence in there and with different leverages that Russian uh, Russian Federation could offer. Uh, but that is a continued effort from the Soviet Union times. And uh, yes, we are worried, but we are also trying to upscale our communication with those countries in the, uh, in the global south and also are appreciative of the efforts that our partners uh, from the free world are trying to to also take in order to to ensure that good is backed by majority of the countries in the world. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, Ukraine's EU ambitions. Um, as we mentioned, you are the chair of the Parliamentary Committee on Integration of Ukraine in the European Union. Ahead of an EU summit last month, um, the Ukrainian prime minister um, said that Ukraine had set an ambitious goal of joining the EU in two years. Is that fair for you, Ukraine, to expect the EU to grant membership that quickly? This is where we totally disagree with um, each other here internally. And I've been uh, pretty vocal explaining to the Ukrainian public that, unfortunately, this is not a realistic belief and we should not target this and we should not mislead the Ukrainian society with uh, being able to join the EU within two years. And I think that this is uh, this has to be done with respect to the Ukrainian society. Uh, however, I think that uh, ambitious but realistic goal is to uh, target the opening of the uh, negotiations for um, accession at the end of this year. And that is where we have to concentrate uh, on uh, our efforts right now. And we have to make our homework. There is a lot to be done. But I believe that this transformation on the, uh, on the way, on the path towards the EU will ensure that, that the country is changed for good. Yeah, and, and, and it includes further measures uh, against corruption, tightening laws against money laundering, and the excessive influence of Ukraine's oligarchs. Your administration, you, you couldn't realize these reforms fully years ago. Um, do you expect, or how do you expect, Ukraine to now effectively do so during a full-scale invasion? Um, you know, I, let me disagree with you. I think that we have shown an incredible, incredible um, cutting off of the umbilical cord with the um, bitter Soviet legacy of um, also corruption and, and different other flaws, include, including with problems with the rule of law and other problems um, here in Ukraine since the Revolution of Dignity of 2014. Uh, and that's why I believe that it is possible for us to fulfill this also part of it during the full-scale war, but I don't believe that we will be able to do all the necessary transformation before the war, uh, the war ends. And that's why I also do not believe that it is possible to join the EU uh, within two years. I think we have to be um, making mobilized efforts here internally on building institutions, on making sure that democrat uh, democratic procedures are uh, preserved, on making sure that the rule of law and the system of judiciary that allows every single uh, citizen knowing that their rights are protection is being built, protected are, is being built. And just briefly before we go, there's no sign that Russia is backing off in its invasion. Are you prepared that this war could last for many years? 
I hope not. Again, the courage and the um, ability to mobilize of the Ukrainian society has to be backed by urgency of the delivery of the instruments that we need in order to protect our people and in order to liberate our land. I think we are all interested in making sure that we are and not exhausted to death, um, and that we are winning all together with the free world, and will be able to to show the country as a new new heaven for investment, for uh, for for rebuilding, for hope uh, after we will win in this war. How do you think the war ends? With our victory, we need that in order to survive. Thank you so much. Ivana Klimpush-Sinsadza, thank you for joining us on Conflict Zone. Thank you, Sarah.